Welcome back to this extended conversation on signal processing, machine learning, and Indian art music with Ajay, Ranjani, Vignesh, and Kaustu. Uh, it's been a fascinating, I don't know, over four segments, I don't know how many segments you've done, but we just you've barely touched the surface, I know, but this is more like a, a introduction to the world of uh, signal processing and its relationship with Indian art music. So we spoke a lot about Raga, uh, we kind of understood the complexities and the difficulties and also the possibilities of reimagination, uh, both in practice and in, uh, for students and for musicology. What about Tala? What were the primary challenges with the Tala idea? What are the primary uh, discoveries? Can one of you kick it off? Ajay. Right. So, I mean, uh, within the... Then it's the... only you're the Tala man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, so, so, uh, so my thesis revolved around uh, mostly around rhythmic analysis. So, so I, I would say like, if you were to categorize the problems that kind of we looked at, uh, it would be broadly in two directions. One is percussion, uh, which I think is, uh, is, I mean, so, so it's mostly analysis of Mridangam and then essentially, uh, I mean, strokes of uh, these instruments and how they uh, interplay. And then the other side is rhythm analysis itself, where is the whole idea is uh, that of like we have a tala as a structure that is like a framework that's provided in time for uh, a particular piece to be rendered. And then how, how do we kind of extract meaningful information of the different components of tala? Uh, and then, I mean, uh, so, so the, the complexity is, again, uh, there is a very clear parallel to melody in rhythm, uh, except that everything that happens in pitch here happens in time. It's the same kind of ambiguity of like doubling of time being perceived as the same as halving of time. And then, uh, so, so the octave perceptions, for example, are, are in, in time here. Uh, and then the, the, the other curious aspect uh, with respect to rhythm is that rhythm is usually defined at multiple levels. And then like say, so the structure of the music piece itself is one rhythm, right? And then, then we kind of go down further and then we look at the, the, the Stala cycle as one particular rhythmic structure. And then we go further down and then we can look at, start looking at rhythmic uh, phrases as one particular structure. And By rhythmic even, phrases, what do you mean? Just to uh, so rhythmic phrases would be well, essentially the the rhythm inherent in say characteristic phrases of a particular say lyrics. So as as Ranjani was pointing out, uh, we cannot stretch a particular syllable beyond a particular limit mm -hmm. because it kind of destroys the meaning after that. So these yeah, these I mean, aspects I, of it. I'm going to just interrupt here. Um, speak as a musician if you don't mind, Ajay. So what he's actually talking about is different senses of laya, yeah. and uh, yes. uh, you know, and using I'm using laya, laya as a sense of time, which yes. is uh, which is essentially its spirit. And uh, when we perceive a composition, we perceive we think we very normally think that there is one laya in operation, but actually there are multiple layers of laya in operation. So you right. have the basic framework of the tala beat, the pulse of the tala, that is one. You have um, uh, the lyrics, this, the spread of the lyrics as one. You have then the formation of melody over the lyric, which for example, gets, gets to Ranjani's point of saying, you can't extend it beyond a right. certain bandwidth of moving a syllable, that's one. And then you have intermediate movements of the melody. That mm. is also a sense of layer. And if it's a concert, then you have above or below all this, the percussionist also then positioning his layer of layer. So I just thought I will, ex you know, uh, try and explain to the listener that when you listen to one composition, you are actually experiencing multiple, experiencing a composite sense of layer, which is a combination of all this that's happening. Sorry, Ajay, go ahead. Yeah, this is like a very fantastic introduction, actually. So that simplifies my life a lot. Uh, so, so, uh, so within all of these, right? So, so there are different uh, levels at which we can perceive laya, and then we looked at mostly uh, the laya that is like uh, that is kind of manifest in the composition because of the tala. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, the different angas of the tala, and then one of the main problems that we addressed was to identify the sama, mm -hmm. and then uh, so essentially, what where in which instance of the whole music piece uh, are there like the sama actually arrives both in Carnatic and Hindustani music. And this is for, uh, for, for a lot of like, so the application, for example, this is a useful, uh, useful problem in a lot of subsequent problems. So if I were to kind of chop and then cut a music piece into different parts, uh, say if, I, if you, somebody asks me uh, an, an hour of Raga performance, if I can make a 30 second summary of this, 
uh, if, I, if we take any 30 seconds, it would not make sense. If we actually mm. start at a particular summer and then take three cycles of that and then mm. uh, stitch them together, then they actually make a lot of sense. It's like summarization. Mm. So these kind of problems, there is a lot of useful uh, rhythmic information that can be used. So this is one problem. The other side was percussion. So percussion in Indian music, uh, Indian art music has a very unique, uh, what do you say, association with language. Right? because we learn with syllables uh, mm. uh, like the sulkatu or bowls in tabla and mudangam uh, and then so those things exactly are like they have a, not one to one but a very close relationship to the strokes that are played on the the instrument itself and then as you know konakol is, is an art form wherein like we speak them out as well so we kind of try to explore this synergy between speech and uh, like the strokes that are played on these instruments and yes. they use them for uh, kind of extracting rhythmic patterns and also for the, for the task of transcription. And this is mostly uh, for... Uh, uh, that's yes. a very interesting point. Sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting you because I just want to ask the question as it comes in my head. Yes, uh, You made a very interesting correlation about um, the, shall we say, the phonetics of articulating sound, articulating rhythmic sound, and, the, and its uh, sound from the instrument. Okay? Now... What kind of relationship did you find there? I'm curious about that relationship uh, right. between what is said and what is played. What is right. the relationship? Right. Very, very interesting question. In fact, so, so we studied this as a part of the ta transcription task. So hmm. I can give you an, a perspective from that side. So, so the perspective there is this. So if we assume that, uh, say, Amritangam Tani is like somebody giving you a speech with okay. a particular meter, can we actually extract out the strokes and then say these were the exact strokes that were played? So if we are able to do that, so we are able to do that very well when somebody speaks, because yeah. that's the essential Alexa problem. So like mm. we can uh, people speaking and we understand them. Yes. So yeah. so the, the the analogy of that is the percussion solo transcription problem, wherein we try to kind of get the strokes. So the main difference here is is that uh, if you really look at it, the percussion strokes have, I would say, limited information compared to uh, human speech. Hmm. So, so it, it just becomes an easier problem because the timbre of a percussion uh, stroke uh, has less variability compared to the same syllable that can be spoken by a human being. Correct. Uh, because, the, because human like voice is, is so much more versatile than uh, a, a stroke that's played on the mudangam. So, so that's the main difference. It's the, so the timbral difference is, is that timbral variability is much more with human voice. But then at, at, the, at, the, at the language uh, aspect of it, wherein like we are kind of stitching out these strokes to make patterns at multiple levels, then that is where there's a lot of creativity and the, the whole structure of the tala comes in. And then there is a very nice interplay between each of these. And then all of this structure can be exploited uh, with the set of tools that we have uh, to analyze and then uh, extract out uh, uh, and then transcribe Mudangam solos. And then this is very useful as a student of Mudangam for me because I kind of I try to understand uh, like the complex muktayas and then every, uh, the, the whole arithmetic that goes behind these patterns. And then it's, it's kind of shows very well when we try to transcribe them. So I have a musicological question that probably uh, comes to when Ajay can share is the sum and the yedipu problem. So if I may use that. So uh, uh, those are very different conceptual notions uh, that uh, you know, Hindustani music and Carnatic music, for example, the idea of the sum, the sum is the energy source of any, any bandish. Uh, it is like the coming together of the experience every time the sum comes, right? Uh, in Carnatic music, the sum is actually incidental mm. uh, to a large extent. Uh, it is the yedup that is uh, where things happen and it happens in a different fashion, not in the fashion that it happens in sum. So I just want, can you, can you describe these two modes of, uh, if I can say accent creation, which is what they do, uh, you know, it's an, both are attack points, uh, but they do it in a very different way, these two attack points, right? So if each of you can just describe it, because the Edupu is not a big deal in Hindustani music compared to us. I mean, there are bandishes with offbeat Edupus that have magic happening, but it is more in coming to that point of sum where everybody is, is there. And we, for example, if you sing Kalpana Sura, getting to that yedupu and hitting it there is where everybody is coming together. So if you guys can, you know, describe the similarities or the difference in approach in that, what you've learned, it'll be interesting for me to know. Sure. Uh, 
Sure, yeah, uh, definitely for Hindustani music also. Uh, now the conception is changing. For example, the Mukhra based Ahmad, as we, yes. we call it, like when the tabla solo player ends his solo part, he doesn't always necessarily ends on the sum, which used to be one very exciting moment, but at the Mukhra. At the Mukhra, it's Ahmad. Mm. Yes. So uh, to address your question, it's very interesting. So uh, with Ajay, I had a collaborative work where we found the most accented and happening beat in a tintal cycle was the 14th beat. Oh. When after Khali, na, tin, tin, na, trek, din. So that din was very emphasized ah. and often not as emphasized as a sum because that really? was the anticipation of the sum. Yes, we, we, so we did you, find that. Are you saying that that din is the anticipation of the sum? Yes. Yes, because that's the 14th beat and the baya comes in play after a long silence of baya because the khali comes na, tin, tin, na and then trek, din, which is kind of anticipating the sum. And okay. often at times, sum is very subdued or even silent in truth layers. Tin, tin, na, trek, din, trek, din, na, na, din. So there is no beat in sum. Correct. But that emphasis point is found. So there is an anticipation of that event coming together. So it's emphasized, not always in sound, but like anticipation, so it might, might be a silent that's, emphasis. That's a fabulous uh, point because uh, then the coming together is in a way imagined because it's actually not physically happening, yeah. no. uh, but yes. it is happening yes. because you've already shown the direction of the occurrence. Right. And uh, exactly, I mean, it's, I mean, that's, that's a fa it's such a beautiful point. Yeah, it's, it's quite true. It's interesting, interesting. That's a very interesting finding. Yes, and I, I, I can't resist the desire to uh, tell one more phenomenon about rhythm. So I have been also working lately with rhythm synthesis, generative rhythm. Okay. So with Akshay, uh, we all know Akshay. So we have been collaborating and based on a very standard generative model, based on the language model of Carnatic transcription. So what, find, we, what we find the feedback, output feedback from Akshay is that it's sounding very grammatical very syntactically correct, often semantically acceptable, but it's not so natural. So that's ah. naturalness versus acceptable is, is the question of where the technology is lying now. So I am trying to bring in some perspective from say human psychology or reflex. So for example, we had one experiment of gestalt. So yeah, oftentimes yeah. some phrases like tariketa. So, so if I play, uh, if I want someone to play, so they might not play it very theoretically, but as gestalt, like thrud, so a rolling sound, which yeah. is very different from the theoretical tarikita. Yes. Or for example, the fractal way of expanding. So if you are shifting, uh, say, trikala or jati to a tishra jati, so you kind of keep the theme. Even if you're in Aditala, you keep the jati and explore in a fractal manner, like pattern within a pattern, within a pattern. Mm. So these are kind of things we are trying to bring in as knowledge constraints to this machine learning model, hoping that it will add to some naturalness with the okay. mixed musician's expectancy because it's semantically okay, grammatically very correct, but not so natural. What so about trying to find and those gaps? And this and this asking a question. What about even the idea of measure, for example, right? Um, um, does that make this make a difference? Because I sometimes wonder whether we don't feel it's natural because we don't have, we don't sense what I would call an elbow room is what I would call. Mm -hmm. um, there is a sense of elbow room in, in time, right? When I yes. sing or when you play and it's not yeah. just a question of extra pulse uh, availability. It's not that it's a kind of, a, if I may use a, a non, I mean, a non-scientific sense, a feeling of curvature is what I will call it. Right, yeah. right. It's a feeling it's of a syncopations curvature. of the yeah. It's right? a natural offset or syncopation. It's, yes, it's so not I very think, theoretical. Yeah, so I wonder whether how much of that is actually also contributing um, to a feeling of it not being natural. I mean, I'm just wondering. I'm just thinking aloud with you right now. That's all. Yeah, so, I mean this. Yeah. So uh, yeah, please go ahead. No, I'll just one liner. I'll add. So we have experimented this on a very theoretically perfect inter onset interval, if we add some randomness, that's good enough. So there is no measure of this imperfection. So if exactly. you add a random randomness of the dis inflections, that's good enough for being an acceptable and natural rendition. So the elbow room is there, but it's very random. So if there is no rule within the elbow rule, but there is elbow rule for sure. But I, yeah, exactly. I, don't, I, I don't think it is random. That's what I think. Because I think uh, even uh, that, uh, elbow room or that feeling of 
it's a feeling of freedom actually in a very weird way is actually yes. not random uh, I, there is a certain so there are a lot could, of dependencies for example yeah it could depend on the composition of course it could depend on the frame but within that frame i think there is something that is an operation uh, that happens for example right. when we take a breath for example we don't think about taking a breath after the third beat or the seventh beat but there is a rhythm that happens mm -hmm. to taking breath within a certain rendition right um, so yeah it's interesting very interesting sorry ajay you were going to say something I interrupted you sorry. yeah exactly continuing on this so 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 we we can define what are called canonical patterns so which actually tell us exactly how a tala is is played if it were to be ideal and then on top of that we have a real rendition of a particular music piece right mm. and that's where you see these variations and then these are these variations can be measured i mean it's very similar to the the, the figure that uh, vignes showed of uh, ga in begda versus ga in uh, in mohana uh, right so that that kind of variability yes. exists and then i mean of course if we average it out over multiple pieces we see it as a, a stretch which is what probably comes to meant by it being random so there is a stretch but then uh, given a composition and given a particular point in a composition that that elbow room as you are talking about is is a necessity to kind of bring about that feeling of say arriving at the sum for example or a particular beat and then and then just to kind of continue on edupu well, just like two sentences here ah, so, that's the go ate I, i mean you always emphasize even while working together you always emphasize on this anticipation being a factor in you know quantifying features or you know extracting features for rhythm so is that what you're talking about that that also may be the elbow room that comes in right correct and then that those uh, those so because we were aware of this so, so these things have had had to be built into the model to kind of be anticipative and to be uh, okay with this variability i mean because typically people come and say tala is a very rigid structure because it has these eight beats all of them are isochronous they are going like a clock but the musical time is anything but a clock mm -hmm. uh, because there is a lot of that variability and that has to be included in our models that extract this information and then that is when we saw success when we actually modeled it as a clock it didn't work but then when we added that variability then it started working and then we could extract these things and edupu is a very interesting problem here because i mean uh, so so anything typically when we start learning uh, so these these models like they start looking at accents like the strong strokes uh, a sudden change in melody these kind of things as you look at this so, uh, so and then we want to now extract sama and then in an edupu and in a piece with like which doesn't actually start on the sama right so the the edupu has the all these characteristics mm -hmm. and then you could clearly see so i i have a few examples which i can probably share uh, some some place uh, but then when we start tracking a tala right so when we start listening and then so this this is an automatic algorithm which starts tracking where the sama is occurring so for the first few samas or first few beats of the composition it misses it it doesn't mm -hmm. know where the sama is or where the beats are but then then it entrains into it entrains into the music piece and then it starts tracking then it can actually say there is a sama even when there is absolutely no event happening there in terms of any rhythmic event so that kind of tells us like pretty much how we kind of think about this so when we start with the music piece like first cycle it's only typically the musician who is putting the tala there and then subsequent cycles people entrain and then they start kind of putting the tala and then are into the rhythm of the piece yeah this is another interesting and this is very uh, very uh, i mean well known uh, little notusurum by by dikshita now when i first learnt it uh this is how i would sing it i mean it's not just put b no tala okay kamala sana vandita pada je kamani gasu du 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 okay but the notation is kamala sana vandita pada je kamani it was very interesting that my instinct did not do that when i first sang it i said kamala my accent was kamala automatically and i took it as what you would call an atita edu right kamala sana vandita pada je kamani so it is that two syllable attack that gives me a sense that is a before beat attack right kamala sana kamani okay so i and the rest is on me which is an extension right so right. i in a way my psychology of music tells me that that extension has to be on a beat right but when i looked at the notation it is kamala sana vandita pada je kamani so it's very interesting that uh, Uh, how this perceptive difference happens also in the way we you know right. uh, approach it yes yeah yeah if if i may i have uh, some moments to clarify about the randomness 
So this this all comes about what level of abstraction you are at the bigger picture. Hmm. For example, the pitch histogram Vignesh so, showed or Ajay talked about. So the breadth or the variability within that peak. So that is enough if we are doing a larger context problem like uh, raga recognition. But if you are doing a melodic characterization of that particular note and the shrutis, hmm. then it tells a lot more things. For example, uh, in Rag Malkons, if I if I may get permitted to just show. No, sure, go ahead. Now, is the theoretical position. And hmm. we have a very broad peak of that knee. So the sa. on the upward movement toward the sa, it's the chadhi we knee. Yeah. And sa the towards the it's the below one. Hmm. So it's not random. It depends on whether you are going a downward movement Absolutely. or an upward movement. Absolutely. But it's it's never a mixed up. So there is randomness, but there is also dependence on which aspect you are exploring. Oh, but absolutely. On a whole, it is a broad peak. Yeah. And I think mean, what you're also saying then is that even in rhythm, there is there is a similar organization, if I can use that. Word. Yes. So yeah, it's it depends on what say in Tin Tal we have seen like da then then da like this kind of delaying. Yeah. But na tin tin na. So as we go go along to the sum, it's kind of trailing back. But as we have just across the sum, it's trailing ahead. Interesting. So these kind of dependencies are there. But yeah, when the same, we take I mean, the average, same, there is a broadening of the peak. The same thing happens in even Carnatic ragas, where um, actually none of it is random. I mean, uh, <laughs> there is a there is a certain organization of movement, if we can call it, right? Yeah. And uh, there is that uh, uh, elasticity limitations that we have. In, yes. in, across schools, yes. across uh, versions, there is that elasticity that right. works within a certain uh, acceptable framework. If you if, if right. you if you if you stretch it too far, it will sound like some other raga for people automatically. Yes. Right? So, so that's why we we use two key terms. One is kind of corpus level analysis, hmm. and one is very like musicology driven uh, single piece analysis. So when we do corpus level, say from hundred concerts, then if we go to this level of abstraction, that we lose focus of the main task. It hmm. also is dependent on the selective attention where we should attend. But for explaining why this peak looks like this, we should characterize, and then it it can't be a corpus level problem anymore. Hmm, so correct. These are the so, two extremes of the analysis. So I, I'm going to pause here because I think we 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 probably uh, I can have a little seminar on this if you go on. So so I'm just going to finally I mean I'm I'm going to like to end by asking you the future of this. I mean each of one of you if you can speak uh, start with Ranjini she's not spoken for a while. Um, what is the future of this? What is the future direction of this? In in because you know if I'm going to use very commercial term there are multiple markets. Uh, you know, you have the practitioner, you have the student, you have the uh, musicologist analyst, and you have, for example, tools for the internet for organizing uh, information, musical information on the net. Or is there, for example, different ways of experiencing music? I mean, I'm also curious about that because uh, right now we experience music only in certain ways, right? Uh, in all these directions, what does what what's the future? What is this? I'm just throwing it all out to all of you. Start with Ranjini. Okay, <laughs> sure. Uh, so, so one uh, one thing is uh, with a lot of music that is around. I think uh, what is already uh, needed, you know, it's like big time needed is the archival. You no, know, you should be uh, whatever information is that can we categorize it properly, store it properly, so that whenever we want, we can do this kind of analysis. That that should be there now. Future, uh, yes, uh, you know, you have this Google search. We'll probably be looking towards a equivalent Google search for. Uh, Indian or the cultural aware music, right? That that is where I'm seeing at least a couple of years. But but again, uh, there we'll have to be very careful when we are saying that because what we are training these machines for is very important. We we should be very very sensitive, if I can say, to uh, towards the culture aspect, uh, so that uh, when we feed out something onto a large scale kind of consumption, we do not destroy. Uh, what we set out to do. So, so uh, uh, I I think uh, last last time I was talking to uh, these folks, I I did give a mention on uh, the analogy to language, right? If if you look at Google Translate or you look at Facebook Translate, uh, and you look at the translation of uh, any of the Indian languages, we are not there. But but the consumption is going to drive the way it is going to go ahead, and 
and yeah i i hope uh, we are quite sensitive to uh, many of these art forms uh, that they are not lost the cultural aspect is not lost in the consumption um, what shall i say the the need to consume so i i would put it that way thank you uh, yeah like what um radhini had said before like you yeah. search something you try like if you want translation right now you just go and google translate it or you know yes. you click on translate this but the translate is not actually not what, the right not yeah. the right not the correct one or not exactly what it is supposed to be so if when you have such tools for music also that what it uh, the tendency to directly just go and google this musical aspect because of ease of access should not compromise the art itself yes yes that that is where i talk about the sensitivity and and hence the rigor in signal processing machine learning music or uh, that that is something that i think uh, all of us should be sensitive to but uh, yeah but uh, i think uh, in terms of future there's there's a lot of things that can happen uh, because uh, i think right now uh, there's a lot of interest in the cultural awareness and uh, bringing in different aspects so that's that's a nice thing actually it's a very nice thing but yeah we should treat with care anybody um, ajay ajay yeah well so very very pertinent points ranjini i mean just to add to that uh so so machine learning itself uh, so signal processing is kind of a saturated field of work now and machine learning is kind of doing everything that signal processing was doing uh what that actually means in if i translate it into our uh, workflows is that we are relying less and less on human knowledge about the signal and then relying more on the data itself so rather than actually saying uh, a particular uh, music culture and it's, it's also we have music culture and then we have a particular manifestation of a concept and mm -hmm. then we until that point in time we used to hand hold the system a uh, machine learning system uh, uh, and then we would say this is what you need to extract that's not happening anymore the direction where it's going is what what's called the paradigm of learn by example so this is when like we throw a lot of data at a particular machine learning system and then the machine learning system is free to choose what exactly it looks at uh, to kind of come up with a particular label so 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 we discussed a lot on raga recognition right so if 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 somebody were like so so some of some of these uh, like say the, the large organizations and then labs uh, they are doing similar things with other uh, aspects like classifying images for example and then what they're doing is essentially uh, take all the data that i have and then assign labels to it and then just give it to a machine learning system without even worrying about uh, what exactly it needs to learn and this leads to a very curious problem called the horse problem so i mean uh, just to kind of like give you one line answer on that uh, so so a horse problem is when the machine learning system learns to actually do and then classify a particular task really well but then it has actually not learned what exactly it means to be a particular concept like mm. it, it 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 can i mean if we give it uh, uh, 100000 recordings of carnatic music it will classify ragas to 99% accuracy uh but then it doesn't even know what exactly raga is correct mm -hmm. so it it's it's so so we are training horses rather than like intelligent systems there correct. and then and then so there are two of course is is there a market for the horse there is really a market for the horse that's why there is a lot of machine learning push but then whether we should take that route or not is something that's a collective decision of the community research community wherein we say we build tools and technologies for music uh which are actually uh driven by culture at every aspect of it like so when we formulate a problem we kind of look at culturally relevant problems then when we actually solve problems uh, and then build technology tools we are driven by what is the need of that particular culture rather than like solving a problem by just for the sake of doing it for a market so these are like very kind of uh, difficult questions and then as long as we are we take a clear stand in each of these uh, i would say the future is is very bright when it comes to automatic analysis and things like that Kostu sure, here almost everything is covered so i would rather uh, focus on the dire need of our community is to establish a dialogue between technologists or scientists and musicians and we should take it iteratively so nowadays as ajay and ranjini mentioned from machine learning now we are in the era of deep learning where even the annotation or structure in the data is not required and the deep learning models can find hidden patterns from a large corpus of data but often times we overlook 
if that is interpretable. So we don't take care of any intermediate stage and see if the visualization of the processing, is it interpretable or is it, is it at all coherent with human perception and cognition mm -hmm. or at all is it learning the feature? So, but if we can establish a dialogue with the musicians, sit with them together and maybe take one step at a time. So what is the need of the community which can serve both as a scientist's problem to brainstorm and musicians really musical relevant problem and solve that and take feedback iteratively and then build on larger problems. Maybe we'll find out a structure of improvisation which is still a very ambiguous problem. And we are, so we have been consciously avoiding these kind of subjective terms, which is not a very good thing for a scientific community. We should be able to address and uh, create a dialogue. So that is the need, I would say. The rest of the points, I am totally in concurrence with uh, all of you. And we, we feel so the same. I'm going to do the conclusion. Thank you all for uh, what has definitely been uh, a fascinating conversation over multiple episodes on uh, signal processing, machine learning. I mean, the scientific community uh, knows this is happening. Maybe a few musicians know it happening, but uh, the larger spectrum of people involved in the in music, art music India at least, uh, do not actually see what's happening. And I'm glad that I got four scientists on board to discuss this and uh, to at least scratch the surface on uh, what you've been doing, what is possible. And I, I agree with Kausu entirely that there needs to be more dialogue uh, of understanding, more than anything to understand the psychology of experience, for example, whether it's the artist or the audience, because a lot of it is actually derived from that. And, and we think it's an ambiguous area because we can't hold it, but it is not ambiguous. It is actually uh, something that it has a design, if you may use that word. And we know uh, well enough now, if you know science, that nature has designs. Uh, it's just that, are we able to see it? Are we not able to see it? That's, I think, uh, where it lies. So thank you very much, Ajay, Kausub, Ranjini, and Vignesh for this fascinating uh, discussion. And um, I do hope you discover many more things and we learn much more from all of you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so you. much thank for you. having us. Thank you. Honor being here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.